hands here. Uh, raise your hand if you have contributed to a crowdfunding campaign in the past. All right, that's a good, that's a good show of hands, everybody. We're seeing uh, about half of it, everybody has. Um, raise your hands if you have contributed to a crowdfunding campaign, to more than one crowdfunding campaign. I haven't right. just one. Good, good. That's great. Because uh, I was looking at a study recently, and that the fact that is that people who, this was a study from Kickstarter, uh, who contribute to crowdfunding campaigns don't often contribute again to different ones after the first experience. But that is great news. All right, now a show of hands if you have listened to at least one episode of the Roaring Crowdfund. Okay, good, because there will probably be some spoilers. Um, and uh, so while, uh, while uh, I'm talking about the Roaring Crowdfund, let's introduce our guests. And I guess the best way to do it would be to do it uh, as we do on the show. And say, my name is Pat Healy, and this is the Roaring Crowdfund. And we profile four very different acts from very different platforms. There's Dutch Rebel, the rapper from Boston. There is Emily Keener, the singer-songwriter singer -song. from Cleveland. Hey. There's Johnny Chops, the rocker from Austin. And P. Locke and Jay Maestro from Stono Echo from Jacksonville, Florida. So, uh, oh, and of course, Louise Augusto Buff. He is a professor, uh, he's a lawyer in Brazil who co wrote Berkeley Online's music business finance course which is part of our graduate program at Berkeley Online. And he's the co-author of Budgeting for Crowdfunding Rewards, which is an important article he wrote with Peter Alhadef. And then uh, to my right is Mike King. And I always make sure to separate between his two names because it sometimes sounds like I'm saying my king. He is, he is my boss, and I guess you're my king also. So, uh, Mike is uh, Berkeley College of Music's Director of Enrollment Marketing. He is the Chief Marketing Officer for Berkeley Online, and he is the course author for the Business of Music Marketing, which is one of our grad courses. Uh, online Music Marketing Campaign Strategies, Social Media and Digital Distribution, Music Business Trends and Strategies, and Music Marketing 101. Let's hear it from Mike. So I guess the first question to start is uh, how have the artists been doing since the campaigns ended? I think you should know that uh, we started this podcast process in the summer of 2017, and I first spoke to Emily at that point. And Emily, your campaign wrapped up in when? When? Um, I believe it was mid-September of 2017, if I'm correct, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, then, and then Dutch, I think yours was the, the final campaign we were covering in December of 2017? October? Okay. Well, yeah, we, we, we spoke. Okay. Okay, so then maybe Johnny, when, when did yours wrap up? Uh, I think mine wrapped up in the fall of 2017. And Peyton and Jay? Just, uh, December, December of what was 2017, right? There it is. Yeah. Okay, so yours was the last. So yours was the most recent. Uh, let's start with you. What have, what have you been doing since the campaign ended? Uh, well, we, we had a couple shows within... Um, 2018, we were um, we did some performing. We did a little traveling with Westaboo Festival. Um, funny enough, as the, uh, the the podcast has come out, we've got a little bit of spike in uh, a lot of things. Um, a little bit more media. We got some in Jacksonville for uh, NPR. We got an interview for that, as well as I got an interview with Jacksonville University. Um, they only found out by the NPR thing, so it was kind of 
all coming back to this crowdfunding podcast that happened. Um, but other than that, we've just been working on the record, our newest record. Oh, great. And when do you expect that to be out? 2019, late 2019. Terrific. How about you, Johnny? Oops. Yeah, you got to press mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, just playing shows, um, put the record out, toured a bunch last year. It was really, really busy. Um, I was on the road a bunch. And um, I've been writing. Uh, in fact, I have rehearsal today with my band, with the Razors, working up some new songs. Just chucking along. That's great. And Dutch? Um, so I was able to... Sorry. She was loud anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hi. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was able to, of course, put out um, the Bang Bang project. Um, I booked a good number of shows from it. I was able to even sponsor a couple of shows as well, giving a couple other artists a platform. Um, I went to the UK for a tour. Um, I actually was able to put out maybe two, three videos and even a, a little project that came out from the songs that like didn't make the project. And um, I'm still very much booking engagements and things from it. And um, for me, majorly, it literally changed every way that I approach my marketing and my business because I got to centralize everything. So things are still very much rolling. That's great. And Emily, how about you? Oh, you got to take it off mute. Here we go. Sorry. Um, I'm in the final stages of production for the album. Mm -hmm. It took a, a lot longer than my entire team thought it was going to, but it's sounding great. And um, I actually just hooked up with a, a great new band. So we're planning some late summer and fall tours to get the word out about the record. And it'll be out by the end of 2019. So I'm really excited about it. That's great. Do you, do you have a title for it? What was that? I'm sorry. Do you have a title for it right now? No, I don't. That's the last thing, last thing to come. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me this, does it feel like... When, when you take, when it takes a while to do an album and it's been for a crowdfunding campaign, I, I remember one of the people I spoke to, Ted Leo, was saying that he's, he gets a lot of people kind of harassing him about, hey, where's that vegan dinner you promised to make me? And um, have you found, uh, is, is, is that the sort of pressure that weighs on you or have you got it under control? Um, there have been a few times where I wished I had the record done before I started it. Um, cause like I said, Kickstarter actually approached me to do my project. So it was, a, it was a very last minute decision. Um, I don't regret it and my fans haven't put any pressure on me whatsoever, which is really cool. Um, but I, I put that pressure on myself. I think I'm really itching to get it out. So yeah, it's, it's been a little bit of a trade off in that. Yeah. Great. Uh, it's interesting to, uh, be here now. Like I said, we started the whole process uh, the summer of 2017, and I was talking to all these wonderful musicians and then um, talking to the professors, the course instructors and course authors at Berkeley and some experts within the field. And if, if you've listened to the series, you know, it starts out with a history of crowdfunding and then it goes into all of these artists' campaigns and it seemed like there wasn't much happening in crowdfunding in general as far as drastic changes. And then as soon as we put out the podcast, whammo, there's this bombshell from Pledge Music. Now, uh, Louise or Mike, either of you, if, if you feel interested in answering this, what um, did, did it surprise you when that happened? With what? With Pledge in, in particular? Yeah. Um, no, not not with Pledge. Um, uh, um, they had been having some issues for a while. Like the thing where it's at right now, where it's totally shut down. Right. Um, I don't know if I, I thought that would happen, but I know for a while it's been, it's been kind of rocky. Um, but it makes me think um, the whole idea of um, fan funding... Um, when you align yourself with a uh, third party, it's a little challenging. Um, so you mentioned the courses that I wrote. There's one that you didn't mention um, that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> and it was called um, something like, uh, 
uh, marketing using Topspin. Right? right. So, man, I wrote 12 lessons about how to use this tool called Topspin, which I think it kind of still exists, but um, it, it, there's some similarities between Topspin and Pledge Music. There was a charismatic CEO um, that I was, um, what's the right word? I love this guy, Ian Rogers. Um, and then he ended up running Beats Music and then he was at Apple and now he works for, um, uh, what's the term? Uh, LV, uh, uh, like a luxury brand, like a clothes manufacturer or whatever. Um, and it just makes me think, like it, having that long view, right? Um, and knowing like in 2008, 2009, things were super hot. There were all of these new companies. And for me, it looked like it was like bright, you know, there's a lot of things going on. Um, I, I almost wonder if we're at this period right now where we're rethinking, okay, is this model even sustainable? And if you look at Patreon as just another example with Jack Conti, um, I think he said something last week was like, I don't know if this model is sustainable, right? So the idea of a third party like Pledge, um, I, I think a lot of what you know, Pledge was great. The fact that they could guide you, they were helpful. Um, the guys that ran it, Berkeley, both of them Berkeley guys, um, they were awesome and uh, super smart. And I, I continue to think Jace and Benji are great. Um, I wonder if the core principles of marketing, like you were talking about, um, how your marketing has improved, if those things can, can still happen, like almost like without the third party help. You know, like you build up your base, you have your own website, you use Shopify or whatever. So, um, I, this has sort of been like when 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 Topspin went down. I'm like, this whole idea is like not infallible. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so that that's what made me think. I wasn't surprised, but I almost feel like you know things go in cycles. We're in this kind of like um, chasm right now of third party partners, and I bet something else will happen. Right? You know? Yeah, I, I think it was this week the Dandy Warhols were the latest band to you know make make a, a public outcry about what happened to them with pledge. I think they had raised $50,000 and it's just kind of frozen right now. And, and, and they're saying, um, you know, what we're going to do is do it ourselves. You know, we're going to like take it and we're going to handle it now rather than waiting for pledge to, uh, not unfreeze it, but like they, they've frozen all the campaigns now. Yeah. It's it's just it's it's tricky when you run these companies and you need to take VC money and then you don't really run it anymore. And the same thing happened to TuneCore. You know, right. they uh, the founder got kicked out, um, uh, Jeff Price, and it's like a different company. You know what I mean? So whenever you rely too heavily on a third party, um, this sort of thing can happen. Right. Yeah, like um, if you want to talk about it, I think there's a lot of things that um, artists can do uh, maybe in a more um, uh, ownership way than relying heavily on the third parties. But like, I think Kickstarter is great. Um, Indiegogo, you know, like there's still things that exist that are helpful, but I just get a little concerned, you know? Right. How about you, Louise? What, what was your thought when you heard these rumblings? Because it started, I think, in the fall, right, was when they first started to publicly acknowledge some difficulties and and but n it's not the first i mean you mentioned the stuff with uh topspin it's not the first times that something like this has happened i think even title last year was hadn't paid artists for a few months and you know title seems like such a not the most sustainable model but it should on paper it looks really sustainable sustainable but um, Louise, Louise, what was your reaction when you heard of these initial rumblings? Sure. Um, first, I think like the crowdfunding, like in general, is a sustainable model, uh, and we've been studying uh, crowdfunding in, at Berkeley, at least for, uh, from the perspective of this course, since 2012, uh, which was very in the early days of, kick of the boom of Kickstarter when that, that was actually growing really fast. Um, and I, what I think, like, when, like, just mentioning what, what Mike just said, like, Jack Conti said, like, is this model sustainable? Like, maybe it might not be sustainable to all platforms, but it's certainly something that is sustainable for a lot of artists. It, crowdfunding has becoming, it is becoming, or has become, uh, a, an important alternative source of finance uh, for artists right now. And it doesn't matter in which form or shape that will continue in the future, 
just like with uh, music distribution, that, that that scenario is changing with Spotify accepting uh, submissions uh, directly from artists, uh, uh, bypassing somehow some of the aggregators and changing the landscape uh, in that scenario. That might also happen um, in the crowdfunding um, segment as well. Uh, so I wasn't surprised uh, because we had a platform, just coming back to your question, uh, Pledge Music was a platform that focused solely on music. Uh, if you look at like just uh, the, our, our more broad uh, platform that we have in the market right now, which is Kickstarter, like they have like a lot of different segments that they cater uh, and they provide services to. Um, and that diversity, just like in finance or investing, like you have to invest in a, in a, in a broad portfolio uh, to succeed, just like labels did with many different type, types of artists and genres. So that model was successful to Kickstarter and, and Indiegogo that, that, that expanded later and maybe was the, the weakness uh, that Pledge Music had was that like what differentiated Pledge Music from the other platforms was uh, what made them uh, weak on the other hand as a, as a business model, I would say. Right. Very good point. And, and Johnny, uh, Johnny is the one who used uh, Pledge that we followed during this podcast. And Johnny, we had spoken shortly after this went down while after we had spoken for the podcast and you said you were paid relatively on time by them, right? They paid me about a month late. Okay. So I did get paid. And I mean, if you followed the campaign, it wasn't a huge chunk of money, mm -hmm. but I have a couple of friends who were also running campaigns that, that last time I talked to them had not been paid yet. Right. Okay. And how about you Dutch? You Kickstarter paid you on time or yeah I'm, so, I'm just like horrified at hearing that yeah. <laughs> I'm like wow um yeah no it was pretty swift um it was it was pretty quick to be honest I, I'm sure it was I want to say it was a maybe a week it definitely wasn't more than two but it was pretty quick okay Emily um yeah it was really quick I mean within a day or two oh wow, even, oh, wow. so yeah how about you, uh, you? Jay and uh, Peyton yeah, we got we got paid uh, instantaneously. Wow! <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, with the it, yeah, the money just we, we got we got paid right on time. That's great. And um, w one of the things that was interesting to me was I spoke with Dutch shortly after we wrapped for the podcast because I got my haircut at the place where she worked, and then I needed another haircut, so I went back. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, levels, but one of the things that uh, I found very interesting was that you had mentioned. I said, you know, so what are you going to do with the money? And you were like, oh, it's all gone already. <laughs> oh yeah, um, um, you know, to the first lesson in asking for fifteen thousand dollars is knowing how you were going to spend it if you actually got it. So there was a lot of pre planning as to what um, I was going to like put it into and um yes exactly being able to get it so fast um you know you don't have time to kind of stray from the plan um there was a lot of you know thankfully my project actually was pretty much maybe like 80 percent finished when i did it um so a lot of the you know i kind of anything that was extra as like cushion money went into just creating more records without being pressed about a deadline or being pressed about do i have funding to give a, a you know a, a higher level producer than you know so um it, it was i already kind of projected where it was going to go but then because i had got it so quickly i and i and i can see the buzz of what people were interested in and what they wanted to see um the rest was just kind of out the window but the beauty is it did like the plans that I had, it, it was regenerating more, you know, like if you put money towards the show, of course, you're going to get some money back. So it was, um, I can honestly say, I think it ran out maybe like two, through two, three months ago. Oh, okay. Wow. Like completely like down okay, to the Okay, see, I thought, I thought yeah. it was like that. Gone. No, it okay. was, it was, I mean, well, of course, yeah, the, the initial, but it just, but it just kept recycling into oh, more great. things. But yeah, that initial like to, you know, take the fee out like 14 right. something or whatever. It was pretty much like, all right, deposit, 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 transaction, send, send, send. Yep. Yeah. Um, how about you, Emily, now that you're, you're still, you know, putting the finishing touches on the album, do, is there still money left in the coffers or has it all been spoken for? 
Um, there's a good amount left, and I think pretty much all of it is going to go toward manufacturing CDs, vinyl, um, T-shirts, whatever. I'm in the middle of designing a bunch of stuff, so I mean, as soon as that's done with and I put in the orders, I'll probably be left with nothing. So yeah. Right. Uh, how about you, uh, Stono Echo? Well, with our with with, with that fun we did, we were uh, re- recouping for the money we already spent to make everything. We had already made everything. Oh right. So. Um, we're working on a, a new record now at this point. So, and, um, and yeah, I don't remember if it paid up. I don't remember if we broke even or not, but, uh, I don't think so. It just didn't get quite there. But as far as for all, everything that we had already paid out, that. yeah, I don't, I don't, um, it was a large chunk of our, our cost that we had already done. If we were to reach the goal that we had set out, we definitely would have had some monies to, to, to spend a different way, but. Um, based on the number that we got, it was pretty much almost breaking right where the yeah, what we're that out. manufacturing costs and this sort of thing. Yeah, right. sure. And, and so you you say you're already working on the follow up. Is that going to be a crowdfunding endeavor, or are you just going to go for it on your own or shop it to labels? We haven't talked about um, doing yeah. the crowdfunding thing. Yeah, that hasn't come. Yeah, that hasn't come up. Um, well, it's up yeah. now. <laughs> It's up now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> at minimum, I mean, it, it, it was even stated in the the podcast how our big deal is really about the quality of the product itself. Right. So, really, not trying to throw something at the public until we know it's something that's really worth getting behind. And um, I do know if crowdfunding is in the future, um, there was a lot to learn um, uh, through uh, the various uh, people that were followed. Um, a different route at going about it where the, the amount of preparation um, and execution uh, you know, Dutch Rebel Re- Rebel, if I'm saying her name right Thank you, Rebel, uh, yeah She showed a really good example of that how uh, her hit squad was prepared in advance how they were going to roll things out and she um, made this thing that kind of stuck with me the idea of it being almost a, um, a political run you know, like a campaign um, literally and to hear how how much of a reciprocal she got from that, it, it was it definitely a lot to learn from. That's great. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, Johnny, uh, you, I remember when we were speaking that you had kind of said that all all of the money was spoken for by the time uh, you received it, and was was that that must have been hard actually not having it yet too, like having it be a month late. <clears throat> um. Yeah, it was it was a recoup mostly for me, um, and and I think that um, Stone Echo spoke to this too. It was a lot about just helping to build an additional community around my project, and 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 have an additional way to interact with people. Um, so for for me, it was like yes, it was cool to recoup a little bit of money, and I'm glad. But I actually think that I may have gained some new fans, and got closer to the ones that I had also. And, and I think in that way, having a third party was good because it was exposure on a different platform. Um, but um, I don't I don't know. I can't speak to, this, to the sustainability of it either. I, I don't know if, if that's not something that you can't really do on your own if you have a fan base. Right. Right. So and you'd mentioned you're, you're working on new stuff. Do you think you'll uh, do it through crowdfunding again? I won't, I won't do it. <laughs> What's that? What's that? I don't think I don't I'll think do I'll it with pledge. pledge. Okay. <laughs> um, Louise, one one of the things that we spoke a lot about, uh, and that was a primary focus of the paper you wrote with Peter Aladef, was uh, artists accounting for their rewards and and making sure they're not over promising their their time and not considering all costs. With the way that crowdfunding is now, is is there anything kind of that you see is like needing to update it or do you see people still same classic mistakes or people are getting wise to that? Sure. Uh, yeah. One of the biggest things we talked about was actually like, what is a successful campaign? Like, and from the point of view of the platforms, uh, a successful campaign is a campaign that reaches the goal. Right. And from our point of view and our study, like a successful campaign not only reaches its goal, but also can fulfill the entire campaign on time and on budget. Right. 
Uh, so pretty much that was the main, like in a nutshell, the main concept. We wanted to study deeper and looking at, at different uh, and researching different um, campaigns and talking to people and understanding better uh, all of that. Um, I think that still is is the like this is the same issue we had in 2013 when we wrote is the same issue that that we still have in the market, maybe less uh, uh, in in a in a smaller level. Like there are people that are more informed that are doing a better pre production for their campaigns, just like uh, uh, the, the other artists here we're, we're, we're talking about. Um, I think that there's a lot to be said about pre-production. Uh, I don't know, and that would be a good question as well to ask uh, for for the artists here. How long after they decided uh, to do a campaign? How long did it take to build the campaign and to launch the campaign? You know, and there's a lot of efforts to go there, like from researching similar artists, similar campaigns, to actually budget the project, budget for the rewards, which is uh, our actual paper. What, what our actual paper is about. Um, talking to fans, getting early adopters involved. I've seen many campaigns, both in the US and here in Brazil as well, that they were able to have uh, the backers before the campaign was launched. And some of the rewards were actually created um, specifically to, to these uh, early adopters, to these uh, big fans you know, that were involved. And this is really important. Because when right when you launch, you already have like a successful traction uh, to your campaign, and that's really, really, really important. Uh, and of course, uh, as well, like knowing where to put your best rewards, get your best margins, and to think about like the where, like how to provide value to your uh, fan base without creating additional costs on your uh, on your rewards and everything. It's still very important. Right. That, that is a great question. Dutch, uh, how much pre-production did you do? And before you answer that, let me ask you people in the audience, when I'm talking to them on the computer, should I be talk, like looking at them like this or does it look weird when I'm looking at <laughs> um, It's fine. Okay. So Dutch, if you'd like to answer uh, the, the question about like pre-production and getting, uh, getting your ducks in a row right. before... Um, it really is a great question and, um, I'm going to try to keep it tight, kind of just piecing in everything that we kind of talked about, about pre-planning. Um, it took us about four or five months, um, because first off the team that I was working with the hit squad, I didn't know them before. So this was just like a, Hey, we have this idea. And I was like, no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> and then they gave me like, you know, well, no, it's an incentive based situation and that changed everything for me. So touching on the point of um, kind of having your ducks in a row, knowing what people want. Um, one of the first ideas we had that we knew was going to be a reward was the video experience. Um, a fan gets to be in a video with me um, because people walk, oh, I want to be in a video. So cool. That's a reward. Um, another one was the How, feature. I so still have to do some of that. No, um, so the, so the, okay, so surprises, right? Talking about surprises. I didn't expect like a quarter of those people to not live in Massachusetts. So that's, eh, like, right? And then of course, um, and, and they've all been very flexible and understanding because with the messages and Kickstarter, you can communicate as much as you want. Um, also just simple, the concept of the video might not make sense with 35 extra people in it. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's all women. And then the guys are like, when am I going to be in the video? So I've, you know, something like that we had, we've had, you know, moving forward, if I ever did that again, it's like, I'd have to, I'd explain that beforehand. Like, it's not going to be in the period of the regular deadline because the videos have to come out with a, you know, a, a campaign or, or a timeline, I should say. Um, so knowing what people were kind of asking for, um, knowing kind of what I was looking for. Um, another one was the feature experience. Um, I knew a lot of artists that were like, hey, Dutch, I want to work with you. But they might not, you know, they might just be starting out so they can't like hit the, the my regular fee for a feature. Um, so you're technically getting like a discounted rate. Plus you might get a T-shirt out of it. Plus you get an autographed CD out of it. Plus you get a, a, an advanced digital link. So just kind of being able to think first like what do I actually need I need to organize all of these people trying to do all of this so um it took months to get that together as far as what are the best incentives but also learning the people that are working with me um there was a lot of graphic 
talk. Like I was in meetings with storyboards, like this shade of purple, no, this shade of purple. Like it was that intricate, you know what I mean? But the reality is um, because I was someone who was very resistant to the idea of crowdfunding, all of it was necessary and I recommend it to anybody doing it because as you all know, once you launch, that's it. <laughs> like, and everyone comes in and tells you like, oh, you should do this or you should do that. And you're already, it's already open. It's already there. All the incentives are already there. So um, I don't, I don't think I would have been as enthusiastic about it or so this is my baby. I'm going to work on this. It, it was absolutely a campaign. Like I was kissing babies and bringing donuts and doing the whole thing. Like every, I'm telling telling you I talk to every single person that is my Facebook friend like down to the first inbox message the hey haven't talked to you in a couple years hi college friend that I saw three times in the hallway I know it's weird but I'm working on something and I'd really like you to see it even finding the language because I was so much like I am not asking people to fund my passion but creating an interactive campaign and teaching people that okay, I hear all the things that you guys want me to do and I hear all your goals like, Dutch, I wish you would be here or you should be on this stage. And it's like, okay, well, instead of saying like, leave me alone, I know. It's like, let me show you how that works. Let me show you how that actually happens. So it was a lot of research and just kind of reading my fans and seeing their day to day and um, just focusing on that so that whatever I planned in my original campaign for the project, we kind of just connected dots in an easier way. I hope that yeah, was everything. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Can I add one thing yeah, to the totally. importance of this. Um, there's um, one of those courses. There's a um, an assignment that I was going to say half like, half don't, but it's more like seventy five percent don't like, and twenty five percent do. And what it is is um, this stuff goes really deep. Um, if uh, this assignment is an Excel grid, and um, it starts with okay, what are you going to make? How much are you going to charge? Um, then what's your cost of goods sold? What's it um, cost to make vinyl? Uh, what's it cost to do these things? And you can add marketing there and all of these things. And then you can uh, assume, uh, this is where it gets like wonky, conversion rates. Um, so uh, you can look at sing low single digit for social conversion rates, like 1% maybe. Um, email, if you have a super engaged email list, maybe convert 9%. And you can do this math and make an assumption, hey, I'm gonna sell X percent of Absolutely. signed CD, right? And if you go through this painful process um, once, you can figure out, okay, I got this wrong, I got this wrong. And then you do it twice. You're like, hey, I learned from that. I could do this. I think it's important to have that before you're just like, yeah, I'll do, you want this? I'm, I'm going for it. And then the other part of it is um, one of the um, campaigns that I funded, a woman that I really love named Erin McCallan. Um, she had... Um, there's this concept of incentivizing people upward. You know, you want them to get, you should have something ridiculous. I mean, not like some people do really ridiculous, but like what's some semi-ridiculous? I bought a semi-ridiculous thing from Erin McCowan, which was, she's like, um, I'll take you to the Red Sox, right? And she's like, I have encyclopedic knowledge of the Red Sox. And uh, I'm like, I'm in. Um, but you know, it was higher end. I don't know what it was, like $250 or something like that. But like, then you think about, okay, how much tickets cost? I'm, I'm spending the whole day with her. You know what I mean? And like, is this really, you know, are you making money here? Or are you losing money here? You know, like, I love it. It's super cool. Um, but when you look at um, the net, you know, and you go through this process, like, um, the time she lives in um, Western Mass, she has to drive out here. There's gas, there's all that stuff. So um, I just think it, it can go really, really, deep but it's important really to try to capture all those costs and then the time that you're putting into it right you know? right yeah emily i remember you uh were last we spoke we were a little bit nervous about composing some songs for people how, how did that end up going and did did it take a lot of time and were they songs that you were proud enough of that you might put them on the next album um, I've written one of those so far and the, the process went really well. Um, the other two, I'm actually still collaborating with the people on cause they're definitely like more involved than I ever expected. I think that's, I, I really kind of overextended myself as far as the amount of time I was investing, not as much money. I mean, I don't have a lot of like international shipping costs or like even state to state shipping costs. It's more like time of my own. So that that's been a tricky aspect of it, but yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And Peyton and Maestro, you guys were, um, I believe you had to do some, some beats for people, right? 
Yeah, and I think I had to do, was it for this one that I had to do a piano? I know for the no, other. No, that was for the other one. I don't that think was my had, other Kickstarter thing. I don't remember getting a beat for this one. I mean, I make beats every day, so somebody needs a beat. And, yeah. and it, that, that was just like, yeah, <laughs> you know. What do you, you know, I just I just need to, just, to have a time to sit down and figure out what they want, you know. But um, I, I have a, try to keep a surplus of music anyway. For, <laughs> no doubt. Just for these occasions. <laughs> when I might want to kickstart, go go something. That's great. Well, I don't think... Um, there was only one of our creative uh, packages that was picked up, I think, and that was a, a music lesson. Oh yeah, how and I, right. I followed up with my um, with our, our friend Doug that was helping us out. Our manager at the time that was really, you know, putting a lot of the shipping together and putting the packages together. But he didn't remember who the person was, and they did not follow up. Oh no! Right, and well, I was like, you know, I was like, damn, I owe somebody a lesson. Right, right. <laughs> Um, what, one of the most striking things, I mean, you were talking about the hit squad Dutch. One of the most striking things to me throughout this process of talking to people was talking to Nate, who, uh, Nate DeLong, who founded the hit squad. And he had said that after working your campaign, he didn't think he'd do any music campaigns again, because people are just reluctant as compared to like a tech campaign, uh, a tech Kickstarter or a tech crowdfunding campaign, because it's music and music is not as tangible as like a little gizmo that you can hold. But what do you, what do you think? And now more than ever with streaming, that feels like the case where it's taken for granted literally because it's streaming it's in the water. You can just turn on a faucet and get music. So I guess what do you see, I guess Louise or Mike, whoever cares to answer, is there a way that we can bring value back to music? Yeah. So, um, uh, if I love a band, um, I just want a physical thing. You know what I mean? Like even, um, so I have, uh, I like this record, as I think you know, um, Kind of Blue. I really like it a lot. You know, it's, a, it's an easy example. But um, I have that record in like, or the Beatles White Album. I have it in like every possible format, you know. Um, and for, you know, artists today, I have the similar sort of, sort of thing. So um, it is less about um, I want to hear this music than maybe it used to be. And it's more I want a, a personal connection and I want to, um, there's this guy, Hugh McLeod, who has this um, phrase called um, social objects, something around which people can gather and say, this, this, I'm, I identify with this, right? So um, I think a lot of it is, there's certainly like going to the Red Sox game with Aaron McCown and all that, but like having a thing that um, uh, is part of my identity and I, I want this and I want to show I'm, I'm, I'm into this band. So I think there's a ton of opportunity. I, um, when I said earlier about I questioned the, the model, I question the model of third parties. I don't question the model of um, uh, connecting directly to fans and putting them through the funnel. And it, here's another, like a, a big issue of students of mine. Um, they don't have anyone to connect with and they're like, I'm gonna do fan funding. Who are you gonna sell to? You're gonna put it on Facebook to like 50, you know what I mean? Like the, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a real issue, right? So there's a ton of work that has to get done um, building up a, a, a group of committed people and it includes touring and it's like, it's a slog, you know? Um, but then once you've got that crew, it's the physical, I think you can think of a lot of different things, you know? Right. Uh, Louise, did you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, it's a very interesting question because uh, we, we've been discussing the value of music for the last 20 years that like it has lost in, in value and now it's recovering, like the whole industry is growing for the last three, four years uh, in general as a recorded industry that uh, it, it's sustained by the growth of streaming, uh, which, is, which is significant because it's a change in paradigm, right? Like we're changing the paradigm of ownership to a paradigm of access uh, and how the crowdfunding will play uh, into that because we're actually pre-selling uh, products. So Maybe there's ownership there. Um, the biggest uh, discussion of, of 2018, probably in the music industry, was something called the value gap. Uh, and in a nutshell, the value gap is uh, it, it's um, discussing the value that some of some platforms like YouTube, for instance, is bringing to the industry 
as compared to the value that the music industry is giving to these platforms or to the to the audience that consume uh, through these platforms. So right now, 40%, basically, like in a general number, uh, 40% of the music consumption happens on YouTube, but only 4% of the music revenue, of the music industry revenue, comes from YouTube. So there, that's the value gap. Uh, and if you look at the IFPI report, and I will mention uh, there's a whole chapter of the last year's report about the value gap. And they mentioned like that uh, an average, uh, an estimated annual revenue per user uh, and monthly revenue per user on, on YouTube is less than $1. Of course, YouTube is free. Uh, um, if you go to Spotify, it, that would be around $20. Okay. And they don't mention, of course, that's not part of the report uh, crowdfunding. But if you look at the statistics on Kickstarter, for instance, an average contribution of a successful campaign is $60, $62. Okay, so there's a lot of value still. Uh, and if you go to Patreon, that could be anywhere between 5 to $15 to $20, uh, uh, an average um, contribution. And that goes straight to the artist. So that, like, on, the, like, on what Mike was saying, like... We, we don't know the future of, of, the, of the third parties, the, th the, the platforms themselves, but like for sure this special connection between, the direct connection between artists and fan, uh, fans uh, have value. And, and that's the value that we have uh, to seek going forward. How to build that value, how to, like this, uh, like if you look at the statistics uh, on like Mike was talking about, uh, conversion rates from email or from Facebook fans and whatnot. Uh, a, a metric of engagement on Patreon, it's a, it's a proof of concept that you can actually sit down with a label and show how many people you actually have on your crowd, you know, uh, and that has indirect value as well for a career going forward to find other financiers, to find other sources, not only from crowdfunding, but also from other sources that will get involved in, in the career of artists going forward. Right. That's, that's a great point. Um, you mentioned uh, statistics and like percentages of things. And uh, one of the other striking things from my conversations with the artists were Emily had said that she didn't imagine that there would ever be a time where she wouldn't have to take care of the business side of her career. Um, and, I think that's a different place that we're in than we have been in the past two decades where, you know, gone are the days where the artist can just be concerned about making art. There's, there's definitely a business consideration to be successful. So I just want to ask each of the artists how, if you could take a pie graph, uh, what percent would you say is making art and what percent is, you know, planning business decisions, planning, finances or you know like mike said doing an excel spreadsheet dutch want to start um honestly it's probably like a 50 50 60 40 situation mm -hmm. only because i would have to say that <laughs> you kind of got to be creative to handle the business yeah. so there is a high level of creative creativity and artistry that goes into how you're going to handle your business um, because with times changing so much and with there being so many genre specific type of marketing going on, like um, I would definitely say like even when I'm handling business, I, I somewhat still feel like I'm, you know, it's the creative side, but um, but it's really hand in hand. I mean, even when you're, I feel, I'm sure the artists know, like nowadays, if you're so independent in the background of your music, even when you're in the booth, like recording the song, you're already thinking about, like the marketing of it already kind of influences what you're doing. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like yeah. people are like, I need a party record. Like, so then, you know, like your mind might already be in that. And that's kind of what I was talking about with the cushion, right. the extra cushion of being able to just go and just make records without thinking, I need one upbeat record and one blah, blah, blah record to round this out type mm -hmm. thing. Um, it, it really is hand in hand, honestly. I would have to say 50-50. Interesting. Can I, can I add one thing? Yeah. To, um, 
I, I totally reject that question. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I, I don't think there ever was a time. No, I mean, when, see, I, I guess I just think like the 1960s where like everybody's in their 20s and they're all stoned out of their minds. And, you know, there's just a manager holding their hand, guiding them to the yeah, next venue. I don't know. You think I there's mean, more to it? Well, all right. I, I mean, I'm trying to think in the 1960s. Uh, <laughs> but, um, no. So like I, I worked at a record label. Right. And um you know, we would sign artists that they had their own thing going. Yeah. Of course, the record label wants to do the um, minimum amount of work. You know what I mean? So um, uh, I, I think that the artist, even going back to, and this was in the 90s, right? right? Like um, the peak of CD sales, right? Um, where uh, the artist the artist that we worked with, it was an independent label called Record Disc, they were doing all their own stuff. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? The label would... Um, we were a bank. We would uh, do tour support. Um, we'd do some marketing. But um, it was really, um, you know, th- Morphine was like one of the bands that I really loved on that label. The guy that uh, in Morphine, Mark Salmon, man, he was doing all the business stuff. And he was essentially like, hey, Reiko, you just go do this. You know okay. what I mean? Um, so I, I, there is this like... Um, What's the phrase? Like halcyon glow of, boy, it used to be great. Yeah. Man, uh, it was never was that there, way. All right. It was not. <laughs> you okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, I, I guess, yeah, I must be like thinking back to, yeah, thinking about groups in the 60s who had a manager and they were led around. And well, you think of the like Grateful thing. Dead, like as yeah. an example, they had their own uh, yeah, thing. They, I mean, yeah, they had their, their own thing. business, you know? But, yeah. um, but as far as the pie chart goes, though, uh, Emily, what about you? How much would you say is business? How much is art? Um, I would say probably, uh, 50% of the time I spend making art, 40% of the time I spend working on business. And then the rest of the time I spend stressing about how much is not getting done because I can't do it all myself, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> okay. And, and how about you, Johnny? Cause I know you've got your gig with the Randy Rogers band, uh, which obviously takes up a lot of time and, um, Obviously, it pays, too, so there's that consideration. Um, it's probably like a 33, you know, there's like, like a third. Mm-hmm. Um, I get about a third of the time to work on business. Um, I get about a third of the time to be creative with my with my project, and then I get a third of the time to work on um, Randy Rogers fan stuff. Mm-hmm. That's probably about as close as I could figure it. I do okay. get a little bit more time with the Randy Rogers band stuff to work on my stuff because like we have a crew and I'm just a small cog in that machine. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not, I'm not the main songwriter, you know, every now and again, I have to learn a tune or help with an interview or, or contribute in some way. But you know, my level of responsibility luckily in that band is much lower. Great. So that allows me time. Like we'll have long bus rides where I can work on the computer and get business done on the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, it's a really hard to find that balance. Uh, like, like what Emily said, I feel like I probably spend a, a good 10 or 15, 20% pulling my hair out going, why did I spend three hours on this when I should have done written a song or something? Right. Uh, it's really hard to find that. And I think um, there's always going to be a business aspect. And I think um, you guys are right when you said it's always been that way, I think any successful artist has probably been in some way a good business person as well. Um, it's always been that way. It probably always will be. Um, you've got to be on your game and everything that you do if you want to succeed, I think. Mm. Great. And Peyton and Jay. Oh shit. I'm sorry. <laughs> my bad, y'all. What you got going on over there? <laughs> Blow my ears out. I'm going to go ahead and answer the question. Um, yeah. Um, as far as a pie chart for me, um, that pie chart is mostly creative. Um, if we c- put in the things like mixing and, um, and editing in there, you know, that might go more on the business side, but, um, things get really compartmentalized for me. I'm either a hundred percent in the creative or if it starts to turn into the business thing, that's all I'm really doing. For instance, during that campaign, there was, I wasn't getting more songs. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't putting much into it or when we are um, looking into the uh, the business elements of the album or trying to uh, get more shows and things, those aren't spaces where I am spending as much time creatively. So my part chart kind of wanes and waxes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mine is like, it kind of just 
depends on the time. It's, it's almost a hundred percent either way. Um, I might spend a, a few weeks where I'm just intensely working on music and then it just, something happens. I run a label too. So something will happen and I'll just have to attend to everything with my partner. Um, but I, it, you know, it probably should be around 70, 30. I'd like it to be around 60, 40, 70, 30. My business partner would probably like me to say 50, 50 at least. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I can't help, but I've been making music for a long time and I can't help but just, I just, I just, mm-hmm. even, even though I have a lot of business, uh, responsibilities, I tend to uh, take care of the musical ones first. Right. And, uh, it's just what it is. Right. And so Mike or Louise, so, so we talk about this notion of like, maybe it never was this way. Maybe it was just my childhood <laughs> idealization pie in the sky. But what, in your opinion then would be, uh, you know, how is an artist to divide their time between business and uh, creativity? Let me um, answer your earlier question again. Okay. A little bit. <laughs> We're just um, going to keep going no, back no, no, to no. this. I just want to say this one, one last bit because it, um, it it struck me that there's, um, do you guys know that book, um, Our Band Could Be Your Life by Michael Azrod? Oh, yeah. So that's another example. So it looks at um, Minutemen, Black Flag. Right. They're, they're just doing it, right? Right. So um, it's kind of like, I, I don't know. Um, uh, it's kind of um, like uh, one of the gentlemen was just talking about. It. It's like, okay, um, what's coming? I got to handle it. Uh, then um, I got this other thing to think about. And so it's almost like um, you you sort of have to have like project management skills. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like organizational. You know, um, and um, where's the best place to put your time? So I've never met anyone where it's like, um, uh, well, I do know one guy um, who's methodical around these 30 minutes I'm going to do this or actually there's a woman named Kate Shutt that I talked about in my class. She's also a, um, like a life coach and she has this concept of, um, in her apartment, in every different room, there's a, like an egg timer, like the, you know? Um, so she's like, I'm going to go play guitar, uh, practice for 15 minutes. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've never heard of that anywhere else. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, that maybe is an answer where you can, you can get that level. She's trying to optimize all of her time in that way. But I think a lot of it is just, um, you know, incoming, outcoming project management. You know? Right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So, yeah, um, just adding a little to, to what we were talking a little bit before, um, I think that, like, as, as most of us here agree, like, there was never a time, I think, that the artists didn't have to take care of their business side. Uh, two examples. Uh, one is Michael Jackson, right? Uh, like the biggest artist on earth was a business machine as well. Like many uh, of his leg- like most of his legacy that, that like the legacy that he left was actually built on, on, on his business decisions and the things that he has done investing in public music publishing that everyone knows, like buying the Beatles catalog and beauty what has become the largest uh, music publishing company on earth. Um, it's, it's one example of, of, of like an artist that was in a place, I think that like he wouldn't have to make any business decisions in, in his life and was there like making important ones. And Jay-Z, uh, like, uh, not probably one of the biggest acts uh, uh, alive currently, he created his own streaming platform. Just, just one of his companies, one of his uh, entrepreneurial endeavors and, and business decisions. You know, not only talking about his career, but like as as the whole ecosystem of music uh, is involved in what he's uh, investing and building. Uh, so for sure, uh, artists will be involved. I think that the what what had what has been happening in the last uh, twenty years and and in this whole transition of the music industry. It's about the like this build up of the myth of the do it yourself, which uh, put a lot of um, of this weight on the shoulders of the artists. And what has actually changed was not that the artists have to do themselves, but that the artists now have the control of their own careers and they can build their own careers, build their own strategies, create their own path, and having control to build a team around them. And that's what it's really important finding the right balance and how to develop this business, which is their, their careers, uh, to grow, uh, with other people around. 
And and to for a comparison, uh, I would say that like doctors wouldn't want to bother with the business side and only take care of the medicine, you know, like and deal with that. But they have to deal with life insurance. They have to deal with the pharmaceutical companies and the, their own firm and how to manage and rent a place to, you know, to to receive their own clients and patients. Uh, and, and you can make this analogy to any other uh, feud um, in, in, in professional field, you know, in the market. Uh, so we're not like the, the romantic view that we have uh, about the, the artists on, in the 60s and whatnot. It's pretty much romantic, but not necessarily uh, the actual truth. Right, right. Well, how about like the notion of, you know, getting signed you know, I think that's a popular notion that like back in the day, if you were signed, that means all, all of that you, people, somebody else mm -hmm. will take care of the stuff that you don't want to take care of anymore. Right. Um, I would love to actually speak to everything we're talking about as, as I'm listening to all the different versions of the, of the answer Um, in, in hip hop specifically, just in my experience, I think that I, you guys are actually both very, very correct. Um, Cause one thing that I'm noticing is there are a lot of artists right now that just think that because they have a YouTube channel and they have a SoundCloud that they are, that they're, they're it. That's it. I am may I have made it. Um, I think that the time that you were talking about the more romantic time, um, what we're experiencing now is the result of people thinking that's actually what it was. Um, I think back then we had a, we had we had more machines. Um, we had more. Um, uh, this label is going to find this one artist and put this fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollars behind them. So to people who don't know the backstory, because the big thing that we have now is social media, which I literally blame a lot of this stuff on, um, because uh, um, you know back then, like we didn't know what the artist was doing all day. We didn't have as much access to what their life was really like. So to someone who doesn't do their research or isn't as passionate, they just think, hey, this person made it overnight, the overnight celebrity, right? But they're, but as we know, the people who stand the test of time are the ones who were always about their business. So now what I think it is that makes it look like it wasn't, it was never that way. I think the difference is that there's now this influx of people who are, who know how many people got screwed over by the people handling their business and know the risks that they run where they don't educate themselves. And the big difference is the, the, the benefit of social media as well is that there are more artists educating themselves. So with them educating themselves, with there being more music education programs, bi music business education programs, I think that the reason why it doesn't look or, or people know it's not just so okay, you just wake up and then you're signed and that's it is because now you can actually see people doing things like crowdfunding and see people. I mean, I still remember going downtown and having the guys chase you down and sell you the CDs outside right. of the music store. You know what I mean? So I think that there is a little truth to all of it, but certain. And the reason why I brought up hip hop is just because to the hip hop world, that's pop music. Like the only way that you can just wake up and everyone's going to just give you everything is when you're like the pop star that's willing to do whatever across the board, meaning I'm going to sing whatever you want. I'm going to change physically whatever you want. I'm going to go talk to whoever you want for whatever you want to pay me because I just want it. But in pop music, sometimes that turnaround is a little bit more, you know, you can get that <laughs> um, because it's just popular music, what is for the time. But people who are standing the test of time are the ones who knew back then. And, and if you really see the ones who are benefiting the most are the ones who followed those models and they're looking back to see how things were done. Um, one of the artists that I actually kind of modeled my, um, or what made me go for the, the project, um, there's an artist out of, um, out of California, out of LA named Nipsey Hussle. And he did his Proud to Pay campaign and it literally started with like the $100 mixtape and then it went to like the $1,000 mixtape and I think like Jay-Z bought like 10 of them or something like that and then that was it, you know what I mean? Of course, everyone was like, let's do it. But he is someone who is known for, I mean, he has like hair weave shops he has like a fish market like and he's very and and that's why people respect him the proud hashtag proud to pay was what I kind of modeled my thing around because there there is a need for educating the business part of music so I think that social media and the you know quick click to learn something is what kind of changed that romanticized version of like the game right yeah. that's a good point just you, you asked about labels a little bit 
To, to your point, the, the education part is really important. Like when you think, if you really think about what a 12% royalty is um, and a seven record deal with a $300,000 advance, like you, it, just as an example, like 12%, that's a, we would have a 12% royalty rate for an emerging artist. Um, and like you really think about what a 12% royalty rate, what is that? Okay, for every $10 that the record label does, you get a dollar twenty, but you only get the dollar twenty after you've recouped all of the marketing expenses. That word recoup. Yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, there's, I, I'm not like super anti label. I think it's the right option uh, for some artists at the right time, but you have to go into it. Like so, you know, Donald Passman's book um, is. Uh, a lot of people are like, ah, you know, Donald Passman. Man, read that book. Um, everything you need to know about the music industry. Um, it's always the number one best-selling book um, on Amazon, right? So anyways, I mean, I've had some people be like, ah, oh, Passman, it's outdated. No, it's not. Like, understand um, what a 360 deal is. Understand the nuances of recoupment. Um, and understand there's very few artists that are even gonna, ever going to be given that opportunity to even work with the label. But right. you got to know that stuff, you know? Um, and it's... Um, it's an it's a nasty business. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but it's a real business. Yeah. Business first, yeah. Um, so one one of the things uh I, I had asked each of uh, the artists to do was to uh come up with either uh something to say to or to ask uh any of the other artists. Uh just because you all I, I spoke to all of you one on one and this is really wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us and it, it's wonderful that you are here together. So if there's anything you want to ask each other, that would be an interesting thing to see what would happen. Do you have any questions for anybody, Dutch? I actually have. Okay, so pardon my not referring to you by name, but when I was listening to the podcast, I was like, I have a question for Jacksonville and I have a question for Austin. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So for Austin, um, how important... Or how much do you rely on festivals like something like a South by Southwest? That's such a massive thing to people who are, um, you know, trying to break in. But people from actually down from Austin, they just have this big thing that just jumps into their city or in their their town every year. And they're probably over it because they've been doing it since they were young. How important um, do you feel like the, the, the festival route? is for the the big the well-known festivals i should say um south by is a tricky animal Uh, as a as a local um when i did my record uh came out last year um it came out about real close to south by in fact like i had to move it around a little bit because i didn't want to do it in the middle of it amen especially as a local because there's so much going on uh, unless you are already signed or you're already big, if you're a young band or a young artist and you're going to like be discovered at South by, it's not going to happen. Amen. Like you're one of 50,000 artists in the same place. So that's likely not going to happen. Um, it's great for networking. It's fun. It's exciting. There's a really great energy all over town that week. It's very cool. But I mean, I did like, I think I did five extra shows. Mm-hmm. And I had to, you know, I had to pay my band out of pocket right. and I, I lost my ass on it. Right. Basically. It didn't really do much for me. Right. Um, I just kind of did it like to have some extra content out. Yeah. I had a lot of things going on. It was more about the PR than it was like playing for a lot of people. Right. Um, so as a local, I, I don't really love it. Yeah. <laughs> it's my so favorite week. I think the best way to do it is to get out on the road and play shows. I mean, we're all talking about crowdfunding. I mean, getting out on the road and playing for a crowd is the original crowd fund. I mean, that's how right. you pay for everything that you do. You sell t-shirts at the shows, you meet people at the shows, um, you make your connections there. I mean, that's where crowdfunding in my opinion is really taking place. But to your question, um, I think the festivals are important if you can find one that fits mm-hmm. and, and I wouldn't even shoot for like the bigger ones. I would find the smaller right. local ones. Right. Um, especially if you're touring and like trying to tour in a new market somewhere, um, right. you know, find like, you know, if there's a hip hop festival that's like in your region of the country, try to play those and loop them together and get to know the promoters, you know, network, you know, obviously you know how to do that. Right. Um, so does that answer your question? No, thoroughly. I, I, I completely agree. I mean, I have my experience and I feel like 
the people that I know that are local, that has been there for the most part, that's been their feedback as well. Like, oh, we hate it. We hate when it comes <laughs> like, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't perform with the band. I perform with the DJ. So even, you know, there is definitely, I agree completely about South by like, I always tell a new artist, like if you're going for the first time, to be honest, just focus on having yourself a great time. Because the first time I went, I was like a month into making music and I had no business being down there. So I was just like, this is awesome. And I'm just like, <laughs> you know, it was, it's always by uh, St. Patrick's day. So <laughs> there's mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Every drink is like $2. So um, I honestly <laughs> found a lot of my solid context by just being, <laughs> being a little trashed and just being like, hi, who are you? You look amazing. And they're like, I'm the CEO of blah, blah, blah. I'm like, great. I love that you love pizza. Cause I would have never, you can't get into this thing. You can't get into this thing. I'm at the pizza shop and you meet like the person that you really need to know. So I, I completely agree. No, I, I thank you for um, answering that question. And then for Jacksonville, how important do you feel or what are some of the things that you do that sh- uh, um, to avoid having to rely on the major city in your state? Um, um, I don't know how often do you feel as though Miami, I mean, I feel like Miami is a certain sonic market, but at the same time, you know, I hear a lot of people in Jackson, like people that I know that go to Jacksonville, they stay there. So there has to be a loyal market. I would, I would think, I would imagine, but I'm just curious as to how does Jackson, Jacksonville stand up against Orlando's and, uh, Miami. What you got? Um, I make my, I, I mean, <clears throat> Uh, that's a little bit tricky. There's two, there's two answers to that. So I'm from Boston. Hey, so you, what? Hey, what? That's you a never fun mentioned fact. that. <laughs> you know, I, Dutch, you know, I grew up with acrobatic and lift. Oh and I my did, gosh, I that's wonderful. Years, so I've done like Coachella and all that with them. Oh, that's great. So that being that's said, great. I, 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 I try to make my, you know, I, I live here personally because I'm, and I stayed here because the, the, the cost of living is more um, up my alley for, for being a full time artist for such a long time. Um, but over the last, the reason I've been able to do that is for for a long time, I've been able to make my money on, on the road. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, when, when Ag or Liv, they tell me I moved to Philly or moved to Boston or East, I'm going to move to New York. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. I'm just mm-hmm. going to, I'll see you when it's time to tour and I'll meet you, you know, at whatever airport or mm-hmm. I will come up and practice or do whatever. So it's probably pretty difficult to, 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 if you're making us trying to make your living here in any sort of counterculture in Jacksonville, I would imagine even in a mainstream culture, it's really tough. If that's if your bread and butter is just this, this city. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I don't, I've always kind of not, concentrated on it. I, I, uh, but I stay here because again, it's much more affordable than trying to do the living I do uh, here. It's a f- more affordable here than it would be in Brooklyn. Right. Definitely. Actually, was I, uh, my show, well, I mean, just on the side of, I could never imagine, uh, looking to sustain myself financially, uh, by the support of the local area, mm-hmm. just just that's just not what it Jacksonville is. Jacksonville is not an industry. Scene. Yeah, Jacksonville gotcha. isn't even um, just as as its own music culture, and even the the listeners they're very loyal, mm-hmm. um, but they're few and far between. Uh, a lot of the people that are they want to stream or they want to they want to know what's popping and what's hot. You know, they can sell out a big. Um, you know, the, the civic, what is the auditorium here? You know, whatever the Memorial Center is, mm-hmm. but on a random Friday, I mean, I even speak for myself. I don't even go out as much, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of the, my music and my creative things, I probably see more people at a, a show when I'm singing in a choir at Jacksonville University gotcha. than I see on a random night that's supposed to be for hip hop. Right. You know, if every night is the, of the week is supposed to be for hip hop, you won't see all of us come in one spot. Right. Now, there is a time where that might not have been quite the same way as it is now, but even when that was in its height, it was still not exactly a, a, a market that you could sustain yourself financially from through your music. Right. right. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, very it. insightful. Thank you very much. Now, <laughs> do you guys have a question for somebody? Um, I, I definitely... Oh, yeah. I didn't have a question, but I threw out my kudos a little bit earlier. I didn't mean to go outside of the order of things, but for Dutch, yeah, I, um, that a lot of the points. And um, even Emily, the way they went at their campaigns, I just learned a lot from it. Mm. 
Thank you so That's much. That's great. Thank you. No doubt. Um, Emily, you ra- you raised your hand. Do you have a question? I actually have a question for Dutch. Um, I have two questions. I lied. Um, first, I would love to know who inspires you, whether it's a musician or whoever, because I just think your energy is awesome. And I like I loved your video that you did. And just your music is sweet. So I would love to know. And then um, second of all, I wanted to know um, if you've done a bunch of touring so far in your career. Um, and if like this whole Kickstarter thing impacted your plans for that in the future. Um, yes. Um, thank you. All the love right back. Thank you so much. Um, so as far as who inspires me, honestly, I'm a weird little one. I would be honest about that. Um, I'm really just inspired by the people, the eyebrow raisers, if that makes sense. Um, musically, I mean, I listen to really all different types of genres. So, I mean, I have, I could say, I could say Gloria Estefan, because I remember being a kid watching her go ham, like my mom's watching her and she's on TV. I could say, um, Andrea Bocelli, that's because he's a blind opera singer. And what are you doing, dude? Like you're, you're doing a crowd of like 3 million people and you can't even see them. Like, so, um, you know, Missy Elliott, huge personality, very, um, you know, feminine, but yet that gray area as well, which for someone like me is like amazing. Um, um, people like, you know, Busta Rhymes, like because of the stage presence. But then there's people like Eric Clapton, because, you know, my I'm, I'm from uh, my family's from Haiti. So Haitian Dominican, like if you don't play guitar, you don't matter. Like so um, people like the greats, you know what I mean? Eagles, Aerosmith. I listen to, you know, you live in Boston. You don't you can't like, you can act like you don't listen to every genre. But if you ever been to the mall, <laughs> You know every genre, you know every song. So I'm really just inspired by um, the artists that make a room of people that have never met each other before say, oh, you know that song too? Like that's, those are my inspirations to be honest with you. Um, And then as far as touring, um, I have not toured as much as I would like to. Um, but I have done, like, I've put together some of my own mini tours. So, um, you know, I've done South by, I've done A3C, I've done, um, you know, I, I did like a stint in New York where I was just like, showcase, okay, showcase, like, let's do it. Um, and then I, I was actually blessed to go to Africa. That was actually right before I launched my Kickstarter. That was amazingly convenient um, that in the time of planning the Kickstarter, I got an opportunity to go perform in Congo. Um, so, I've, I would say I've had some notable locations, like I've done North by Northeast in Toronto, um, but I've never actually been on a like industry backed, here's 10 dates tour. And that was kind of what another thing was that made me really want to do the, um, the uh, Kickstarter because um, one of the crazy things that I had to do, and I'm sure Pat remembers, but um, the same month that the last day of my Kickstarter, I got an opportunity to apply for a grant for the same amount of money that I got from my Kickstarter. So when I had to present the grant, I was presenting a $30,000 budget for like just everything, including like certain shows. So that's how I was actually able to go to the UK, things like that. Um, the, um, lab foundation, the live arts, the live arts, Boston, like they are amazing. They fund a lot of great art programs. Um, I, the, the limit, I mean, the max was 15. I asked for 15 and I got 15 and I've still attending events and the network is absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, I, I think that the Kickstarter, the rumblings of it kind of made people say, oh, you should do this. You know what I mean? But, um, just kind of going back to, to, to the shows and the tours, um, Doing the Kickstarter absolutely made me feel like I don't need to be stalking booking agents as I probably was before, because now being able to centralize my fan base, um, I also have something called a super phone. I don't know if you guys know about this, but it's um, it's a Ryan Leslie is an artist and he created this like um, app that allows you to basically I give you my number 617-860-3557. You shoot me a text and it just asks you to like fill out whatever information you want. It's just my address book, basically. And I'm able to, you know, I can literally just say, all right, Texas, text the 10 person people there and say hey I'm doing a show in your city you want to pull up or I do things sometimes where I like cook and stuff like I like to cook so I'll just be like yo come over and I'm gonna do like we had a taco bar at a listening party once like stuff like that because um again going back to everything we've been talking about I think the major benefit of crowdfunding is we're not really selling you anything we're asking you to invest in this 
campaign. Um, that was the energy of the campaign. I'm not asking you to buy anything from me because you choose whatever tier you want. But um, being able to just kind of show people what they are investing into and what they're being a part of really changed my method uh, or my my strategies with touring because now it's like I'm not really worried about like opening for someone that was probably what you would try to do beforehand but if you can fund it and you can talk to people directly like I'd rather have a room of 100 people and invite 25 to 30 loyal fans and give them like everything I could possibly give them in one day. Um, it absolutely, I'm sure you guys would all agree, it lasts way more. I mean, I have fans that are literally like, I was 12 and my mom was like, you know, she she read your article or something. So now I'm 17 and I'm trying to sing. And I'm like, word, you've been incubated for like three, four years. Let's do it. Like, but um, but that's that's the beauty of the um crowdfunding and just kind of how it all tied into what I'm doing. And I thoroughly hope that answered your questions. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's awesome. I think Word. the super phone thing is such a great tool. I was like, I had my, my jaw was like dropping as I was listening to that last episode. I'm like, holy, it's wow. Crazy. That's like just the best. And, and I suggest it to everyone because the, honestly, and I'm sure you guys know, the beauty is being able to finish a show. Because of course, you know, if you're doing a show in a new market, you don't know, you don't necessarily have loyal fans there. So I got seven minutes do what I do. And then right at the end, when I have them at the height of the, oh, who's this girl? It's like, do you guys want to get in touch? Pull your phones out. 617. And they're like, what? What? And that's our area code for those who don't know, like 617. And then it's like, and then I give the number and some people are like, oh, w w I'm not sure if, I don't know. But then by the end of the night, I just have all of these texts and like one of my things is kiss, kiss, bang, bang. So when I say kiss, kiss, the crowd says bang, bang. So the end of the night, I just get all these kiss, kisses. You know what I mean? All the kiss, kiss emojis and stuff. And um, that is, it, it really does just change how, what you stress about. That that 10% between that 33 and a third, I concur, bro, because that's what it is. But just just, you know, all of these things just fell into my lap by just going, honestly. Like I'm not, like a tech person. I'm not like researching at all. It's just like I went somewhere like here. I'm sure I'm going to meet some people in the crowd that are going to help me with my next adventure. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great too, because uh, one of the things that I thought was very interesting, and Mike, you brought this to my attention and, and Emily, I remember you reinforcing it about, you know, you can have so many social media followers, but having their actual email address is way more important. And Dutch, you can attest having their phone numbers is, is even more of a personal connection. I mean, even though, like, I know their birthdays. I can text you, like, <laughs> happy birthday. I met you three years ago. <laughs> and then yeah. they're like, cool. 100%. Great. Like, I, I got the most contributions from my email list during my Kickstarter yeah. campaign. And I have like 850 people on it doesn't sound like a lot way less than I have followers on all my social media platforms. I have thousands on each like different one, but it doesn't make as much of a difference as that direct like inbox thing. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Can't trade it at all. That's great. Um, Johnny, did you have a question for somebody? Are you talking to me? Oh Sorry. yes. Sorry. <laughs> uh, did you, did you have a question for one of the, your fellow artists? Um, yeah. So when does the show happen that we're all a part of and we do a big bill with everybody? Yeah. For real. <laughs> well, yeah. I was going to say like about touring, I, I'd love to Berkeley. watch it, watch you all perform. So that would be awesome. Yeah. I'm thoroughly stalking all of you guys, by the way. And I need to know all the cities and States and venues and all that. Absolutely. I, I saw Johnny with the Randy Rogers band when they played the paradise. So oh, I came oh, out. It was really here. cool. Darn it. Yeah. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't Johnny's solo career. So oh, good. He was gig, in the building. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> oh, but um, uh, I did have a couple of just little questions. I, and, and I may have been stuff that I missed in the podcast, but I was kind of curious. Um, Emily, did you ever, did you ever adding someone to your team? Like, did you, are you still doing stuff yourself? Did you find someone to help you out? Um, I have more people helping me out with the creative side of things and with the business side of things still, um, like collaborators and uh, a couple producers that I bounce ideas off of and that are working with me on the record, but I'm, I'm still kind of flying solo on the business stuff. And it's, um, I'm, I'm ready to, to leave that chapter behind at some point in the future. So I'm, I'm just keeping an eye out for someone who's willing to help <laughs> but, uh, well, well good for you you're you're obviously doing a great job and i was i was inspired by hearing that like you're you're doing great you're taking care of your business like a pro it's awesome 
Thank you. Thank you. I felt the same listening to your story, man. I'm really glad that you, uh, you met that goal, even though you had to cut it down a little bit. It's sweet. Hey, I'm here talking to you guys because of it. So that's cool too. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Anybody would like to ask any questions? Well, don't be shy. Yeah, don't be shy. And we also do have an email uh, list over there that you can go sign because, as we said, email is very important. And the gentleman back there, Eric, uh, I saw you were raising your hand. Okay, what is it? Yeah, do you want to come up to the mic? Oh, sure. Great. And you could even like tilt your head into the camera so you could see, so they could see okay, you. Okay, should I move this over here? Or just move your head in. Okay. You could take the mic off. And... Cool. There you go. Hey, guys. Um, I was wondering uh, from your campaigns and everything, how did you guys get creative with getting people involved in the project like itself, other than sort of like backing and stuff like that? Did you guys like take people kind of, on the trail of the campaign to kind of keep using that like metaphor and everything like that, because I've, at least in my own experience, I've always found it so advantageous to have people involved sort of on the creative side and everything like that. Obviously, I guess you have to kind of draw a line there to some degree, but um, I guess, yeah, like ultimately like what strategies have you guys found that has ultimately like made people like that much more invested in your music and your project. And if you kind of incorporated them into the campaign. And the question. Um, I guess we could go, yeah, we could go in order that we see the people. So we see Emily on the top left. Um, I, I definitely had like personal conversations with people about how the, the campaign was going, like with friends, family, extended friends and family, whatever. I don't know that my campaign was as interactive as some other people's. Um, I was definitely coming at it from, you know, more of a platform standpoint of just getting the word out there and people seem to respond well to that. So I kind of felt like I didn't really need to do much more in my case. So yeah, that's, that's how it went down for me. And Stone and Echo? So um, with our campaign, it being uh, unique in those two ways where we already had the project and um, it was kind of a pre-order. A lot of the people that were already invested in the project, it wasn't exactly material that, that was new to them. So um, content was a little bit of a, a difficult element to kind of stretch apart, stretch along with things that they were already familiar with. We were really banking on the fact that now here's your chance to get this tangible um, collector's item almost, because, you know, those vinyl most specifically is where our push was. And a lot of our other uh, perks were simply merch. So um, with it not being anything that was really new, uh, we didn't have a thing to kind of press on as if we were in the middle of recording the album or had new things to present throughout. Right. Johnny? Um, yeah, in a word, I think exclusivity. Um, so I did the uh, merch stuff, but I only did it for the Pledge campaign. So the, that was the only place you could get it. Like you could you go to someone's website and get their merch or get a record. But I tried to make stuff that like that was the only way place you could get it was by getting it on the campaign. Great. I guess I sort of have a follow up question to that. Um, I'm taking over the mic now. Um, did <laughs> put, you guys put, sh show your face? Yeah, I don't think sorry. they can see your face. <laughs> um, can did, you see it in the. Uh, sorry. There we go. Hey, <laughs> um, did you guys notice people share then sharing the content too? like about your like getting the word out about your campaign? Um, yeah, I, I definitely had a lot of folks sharing it all over social media. Um, and I think that that was a really, like I said, um, in the podcast, one of the turning points, like towards the end of my campaign was doing a Facebook live. I did an Instagram live at one point too. And both of those things were really, um, successful. Cause I mean, it's the first thing that shows up on people's timelines when you're doing a live show. So it's, um, I feel like that was one of my more direct approaches to that. Yeah. Terrific. Thanks, guys. Well, uh, does anybody have any other points or suggestions? Um, that I didn't actually get to well, answer Oh, question. sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, good. I've said enough. All right, Dutch. No, problem. take it away. Um, no, I, well, I, it was 
what you're speaking on, actually, what you asked about probably got me through the last final um, line, to be honest with you, because it was four weeks. The first week was a boom. The second week dropped down significantly. And then that last stretch is what gets everybody um, really into it. So one of the things that we did was um, that little the side project that I had mentioned, I called it No Stems. It was literally all the songs that someone lost the darn stems for. So we just put it together in a project and that we made a T-shirt like you're saying, exclusive merch, but we actually had the scan code on the T-shirt. So if you were you were wearing my project, so just keeping that, giving people that type of power, they're like, oh, I'm walking around. It's like, hey, scan my shirt, scan my shirt. Watching that turned into trying to get people involved in um, uh, some of the companies and local businesses around actually started running their own little mini um, support campaigns. So it'd be like Lace Boston is a boutique out here. And they were like, if you pledge and you show us your pledge, you'll get 15% off, like stuff like that. So there were different companies that were kind of getting involved on their own. Um, so anybody who is thinking about crowdfunding, absolutely use your community because a lot of people really, I didn't expect that, but at least three different businesses um, just sent me the graphic. It was like, we're doing this. So it was awesome. Yeah. So we, I guess in some, in summation, what, what would it take for you to embrace another campaign to do it again or not do it again? I guess Dutch, let's start with you. Huh. Um, I mean, if I ever did it again, I'm asking for double because go hard or go home, <laughs> obviously. But um, it would take, I know I'm not, I don't want to do it yet, but I think that if I was to do it again, I would probably pair it with some type of like a nonprofit organization or some type of like alternative um, incentive um, just because with the model that I learned from doing it, I, I want to focus on those things for now. Um, you know what I mean? I almost feel like I could almost, cause you know, coming up with all those, those rewards and fulfilling them and all of that does, it is a very lengthy task. So, um, I might probably do something like even like a GoFundMe or something. Right. That's a little yeah. less like if I hit it, I hit it. If I don't, at least you guys know what's going on, but right. that Kickstarter thing and that a dollar off and you get nothing is stressful. Yeah. So yeah. I need time. I need time. Yeah. I can't uh, do it again. Yeah, yeah before I get to the other artists, how was the Red Sox game with Aaron McCown? I didn't pay much. Uh, <laughs> I didn't pay much attention to it. I was just yeah. hanging with her. Oh, that's you know? great. So <laughs> I, I don't remember. I just remember being like kind of odd, you know, because um, I think she's a great musician and she's definitely like way into baseball. Yeah. I'm not really into baseball yeah. that much, but I thought it was cool to hang with her, you know, so I was more like, yeah. That's yeah, great. That's a good question. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Taking what what Dutch said, what what would you do differently? Um, uh, starting with Emily, what would you do differently if you did no, another campaign? Um, I I would definitely not decide to do it two weeks before it was supposed to go live. That <laughs> <laughs> that was not a guys. If Kickstarter approaches you and asks you to be part of a project, no matter how nice it sounds, if it's two weeks beforehand, it's not a good idea. No. Yeah. I mean, the end result was really good for me. Obviously I got, I got the goal and even surpa uh, surpassed it a little bit, but, um, it, it like the podcast was talking about the other aspect of a successful campaign is how you can fulfill the rewards and actually make it work after the campaign is over. Um, so I, I would definitely put months more planning and preparation and, and would team up with somebody uh, like a consultant or whatever made sense. Um, if I ever did one again, that is. So. Okay. Stono Echo. Um, as I touched a little bit earlier, I know planning um, and preparation would be a big deal. And I do like the uh, idea that John mentioned about things being very exclusive for the campaign. So they know that it's even more special. But additionally, um, just in the thought of in listening to everything, uh, the idea of maybe the crowdfunding being for something that's not a project would be a little bit better. Like what if a lot of our local artists, they want to see us do, um, I mean, a lot of our local fans, they want to see us get to another level. So we, it might be wise to have them invest in helping us uh, shape together a, a tour that takes us uh, overseas or to another part of the country. Um, have those uh, expenses kind of mapped out and let them know what our goal is. And that might be a different route, but um, it would just definitely be different if we were to do a record again. Mm -hmm. Johnny? 
Yeah, I, I love that idea of having it not necessarily be for a record, but something else that maybe helps your career. That's an awesome idea. I'm going to write that down, actually. I'm going to borrow that idea if you don't mind. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think planning for sure if I do it again. Um, and I think really simple interactions, like kind of like what Emily did, like with her live videos. I found towards the very end of my campaign that those were the most effective things that drove people towards it was just getting in front of your phone and saying, hey, everybody. Um, it's day 18 of the campaign. Here's half a song. Um, you can hear the rest. If you, you know, do low budget, simple stuff seemed to work really well. I would definitely do more of that. And I would schedule it regularly if I did it again. Um, and like I said, I probably wouldn't use pledge again right. unless something happens with them. <laughs> right. And, and Louise, what, what would you tell, uh, any of these artists for what, what do you think is the most important thing to pay attention to when doing a sophomore campaign. I mean, I know Emily, you had done one before, but when when you're, when you're doing a new campaign, when you've already done one before. Sure. Um, I think like pretty much was said, a lot was said already about planning and preparation. As I mentioned, like pre-production, I think it's key, uh, for a successful, not only for the campaign itself, but like for the entire project. Um, I think that that is definitely the key to to succeed uh, with with the project. Um, thinking about a great way to go because I think it creates scarcity and cre- scarcity creates economical value for for the pro- for, for the products. But also try to find experiences, not only products or things that people would care about. But what are the experiences? What are the things that are unique that people could live and be part of the project with you? Are are thing? Uh, I think it's it's a, a very good way to go and a good way to to succeed as well with the campaigns. And um, I interviewed a lot of uh, for another project for a side project that I had uh, a few years ago. I interviewed a lot of uh, other people. Um, that did crowdfunding campaigns and some of them, and, and it was actually really interesting, uh, were actually doing, uh, it was before the Patreon uh, time, like with recurring crowdfunding, you know, they were actually doing recurring Kickstarter projects because they had their fan base established. They had the connection. They had the, those contributors, those mega fans that would contribute uh, for, for that kind of project. So catering to them and keep the communication, keep the conversation going and keep offering them projects might be a good way to go as well. Like, so uh, I know that it's not in the, in the line of, uh, of, uh, of site for your, for you guys right now, the next uh, crowdfunding project, but think, consider that as, as a way to reward your fans that already contributed to, to your campaigns because they're part of your careers, part of your lives. Great. Mike, do you have any parting words? Um, I, I guess just what I was saying earlier about um, learning, you know, from, I don't know, your mistakes or, you know, being sure you value your time appropriately. And then, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just stuck on this. Um, cause Is this going to be, be about me thinking that artists didn't, uh, <laughs> that they oh, could? Oh, yeah, let's <laughs> talk more about that. No, um, no. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I think you can do a lot of this stuff without these companies. I'm telling you, like, um, you can have, you go to WordPress, set up a site, um, have an e-commerce there. And then there's, there's similar, it's just marketing, right? And you're driving people to your site and you can, whatever, you have flexibility to do things there too. I, I realize not everybody is, um, you know, able to do that technology wise, but there's Banzoogle and there's, there's these sites that make it easy. Um, that I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of grappling with like, do you Kickstarter? It, it, it's great. And it, it, there's a, you know, there's a function there and I, I, I get it. I would just like, I don't know. I'm kind of like reverting back to like, even like before pledge existed, like just do it yourself. Just do right. it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so great. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, thank you to Dutch Rebel, Mike King, uh, Peyton Locke, Jay Maestro, Emily Keener, Johnny Chops, uh, and also Jesse Borkowski, Eric Zawada, Colette Greenstein, Marco, Margo Edwards, Alan Bush, 
Uh, Greg Fauscher, Mark Thomas, Andrew Walls, Melissa Henderson, Emily McInerney, Debbie Cavalier, uh, Kyle Moskaloff, Yu uh, Yum, Young Kim, and Riley Parkers. And thank you all very much for coming. Thanks, Pat. It's Healy. very much appreciated. Oh, thank you, guys. It's nice to see you again. Bye-bye. Great to talk to you guys. Nice to meet Bye. you guys. Bye.